Hey, I'm Tabuli. I'm recording from the map room where my friend Tristan and I discuss all things related to Atlas Altera, a creative exercise for repainting the world. In this project, we use a familiar but different map of the world to tell the story of us, humanity. You can find more visuals on atlasaltera.com, listen to the podcast version through Anchor, and find bonus materials on Patreon. Today, we continue to draw from the topic of choreography covered last week in episode three while focusing on the idea of globalization and how it takes shape in Altera. I hope you enjoy, and don't forget to like and subscribe. Mm -hmm. Cool. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, we went quite in. But just so, just to bring it back, because we're still in an in introductory yeah, episode, overview. you know, overview. Uh, yeah. I wanted you to talk a little bit more about uh, globalization okay. and how um, how that happens in your world, because you talk about uh, a lot of historical contact between different regions and different peoples. Uh, but how? Um, yeah. How do you? How does globalization happen in? in your world. Okay, that's a really good point. A future episode, actually, we're going to talk about one of the map arts and the choreographical thing, which is a really good way of explaining my idea of, the, uh, of globalization. But for now, we'll talk about it in a more theoretical sense. Um, and this actually relates to that idea of choreography that I was talking about earlier with uh, the French idea of circulation, uh, Vidal de la Blache. Uh, Rotzel had a similar word. He had vercaire, which I'm told by my uh, vercaire, I'm told by my German friends that it means sexual intercourse. Um, but you can see the intercourse. Intercourse, circulation, verkehr, traffic. These can all be used as innuendos. You know, it's like contact, doing things together, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, intercourse would probably be the English word for that. But circulation is what? Like swapping of fluids. Yeah. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but circulation is also tr like traffic. Like you use the word circulation sanguine, like the circulation of the blood. Yeah, of blood, yeah. And in English, we still have the word circulation as well. And we use it in similar ways. But the point is, these two geographers had very flawed ideas of what the end of history would be. So they were dealing with Hegelian sense of history and progress, but in their geographic kind of world. And actually, one of the last people to resurrect this idea was the Chilean uh, president, Pinochet. Um, he believed that uh, Chile needed to engulf its neighbors and, you know, uh, like to be great, Chile would need to flex itself and kind of expand its cultural influence okay but not like in a soft culture way so he was kind of a bit warmonger obviously he didn't do that but there was like language used hmm. that re uh, resembled this kind of idea of engulfing and shaping the world as you uh, to be you anyway so as i said Vidal de la Blache thought that the, the death of the arab was coming you know the arab was going to become french uh what's the famous french algerian writer uh, Camus? Yeah, Camus. Uh, yeah, Camus. Camus. Yeah, yeah. Like, like when he was writing, that was like the French colonial discourse. They thought, yeah, sooner or later they're gonna become us. We just like we just have to keep on, you know, teaching them. You know, in mm -hmm. Lebanon, they have to sing the French a a French national anthem. They have to learn French culture as well as Lebanese culture. Like, mm -hmm. it was very bizarre. Even to the seventies, they're doing the, yeah. this. Yeah, he, he was a conflicted. Uh, he was conflicted between Algerian friends. Oh, well, we no, don't no, have to go. No, no, no I'm not talking about Camus. I'm just saying he's right. Yeah. The context he was writing, like the outsider, that flashpoint. I'm not saying he lent himself to this kind of thinking. I'm just mm -hmm. saying, uh, for someone who wants to an in depth idea of what I'm talking about, they can read that book. Yeah. Right. That colonial setting. And so, uh, you know, in Lebanon, even to the 70s, like they were like still being taught French history in their textbooks. Right. Uh, so this idea has been co-opted with with liberal globalization. OK, so liberal globalization actually had two tenets. It's not just trade like the modern day people who uh, who rant against globalization see it as an economic force. But globalization used to be too. Uh, two sides of the same coin for an idea of liberalism. Uh, one was to to make the world enlightened in a moralistic sense. And enlightened is a very loaded term. But uh, the way that these like like Kant or deontologists and these kind of, uh, or even utilitarians like Mill, they were like the way they were writing about liberalism was elitist, but also lent itself. It was like a uh, a card that people a check that people could future like future people could cash in. I saw that in a movie a couple of days ago. Basically, um, the Constitution. There was an argument that a U.S. Constitution did not grant you know freedoms to everyone right away, but it was a check for people to uh, to check in to cash in. It was a check for people to cash in into the future, and like this idea 
is actually what a lot of British people love about America. Like, you know, if you, um, what's his name? Stephen Fry, the rebel, you know, the gay rebel who, who says, damn you to PC culture. Um, he, Stephen Fry loves America, even though he loves to make fun of it. He loves America because he thinks it's like the first and probably the last, uh, project enlightenment. A whole country that built their culture around enlightenment. Obviously, people can counter that. But he has one point that I like to fold into my e pragmatic ethics, which is that when people started writing about the enlightenment and liberalism with these kind of universal ideals, but that were, um, that lent themselves to supposedly anyone, that was a check that could be cashed in by the people that are being oppressed. Okay, so it was language that lent itself well to hypocrisy being pointed out okay so the point here what's my point oh the point here is liberalism had two faces one was the liberalism of free trade and one was the liberalism of morality and i think that morality side has died off just as the united nations says relevance to people has died off in the last 50 years when i was learning about the united nations in the 1990s that was probably the final days of this idea of global citizenship and the un now, no one believes in that, I think. You know, the world is so fra fractured and fragmented that, you know, the blue helmet and, you know, peacekeeping, it's not seen the same light anymore. We were probably the final days, and already that was a time when it was eroding. That kind of uh, optimism and that kind of cosmopolitan idealism outside of trade was one stream of liberalism. And the other one was, hey, don't deny me the right to trade with you, <laughs> which is really funny because a lot of times it's being um, argued by the person who's more powerful. And the Americans go in with their gunboats into Japan's harbors and go like, hey, don't be, be prejudiced against me. Trade with me or else I'll shoot you. Like that argument has always lent itself to imperialistic ambitions. Okay, this idea of free trade is usually laid against the less powerful. But the other side, the moralistic side is usually leveraged by the less powerful. And that's the side of globalization that I want to rein back in and make the fundamental kind of overlaying political rhetoric in my idea of globalization, which is why I say techno technological transfers might be slower or development might be slower, whereas mutual understanding is uh, more sophisticated, robust. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so that's the globalization I'm trying to resurrect, that kind of a cosmopolitanism. It's a bit idealistic, mm -hmm. but it's worth pursuing. Mm -hmm. So having a more cosmopolitan world... Um, has undertones of better or greater cultural understanding among these different countries, right? Yeah. So how does culture or exchange of culture come into uh, play? Right. So I should clarify, I don't want everyone to just become the same culture. Like the cultural understanding is not going to, this mor this kind of liberalism, this morality thing is a negative sense. It's usually about spreading negative rights, which is, Sorry, I know it's it's going. We're going too deep in here, but negative versus positive is a very crucial distinction. Positive is usually saying you need to be something, and negative rights is usually you need to be refrained from some sort of action. So you need to be allowed to do what you want, and the person is not able to prescribe what you want to do. Does that make sense? Like so, mm -hmm. um, it's like, like freedom of religion is a negative right because it's like freedom to practice whatever the hell you want. You can be whatever you want. The the text doesn't even foresee what kind of religion, the Baha'i faith, or like some like new age religion. They can't even foresee that. They're not gonna write no no this right. They don't even have the idea ability to foresee what's gonna happen. And they're saying you can't be prevented from doing that. And so a neg like this kind of liberal canon of rights uh, is, you know, very outdated nowadays, you know, post-colonialism and like everything's all relativistic, man. Like I get that, but I still think we need to really embrace this core thing. Okay. And all these cultures around the world that we have might be more confident if that was the only thing they were told. Okay. That they could be whatever they want to be. And that's it. Not, hey, you should dress in a fancy suit with a tie and go uh, go to work wearing a briefcase and, you know, be told that leather and like all like this kind of certain fashion sensibility and aesthetics is like the way to go. The, the point is culture is it's not ornamental and it's not even decorative. Decorative is a bit better than ornamental, right? In that it has certain meanings and ornamental is just like uh, 
you know, to, aesthetic. Yeah, to, yeah, just pure aesthetic of joy. But usually, culture has deep meaning, deep significance, and I would just welcome people to uh, open up lectures by like anthropologists. Do, do a TED talk on any uh, famous anthropologist, and you might be convinced that culture is more than that and that it's worth preserving because culture is like worldview a lens and uh people in the west think that they're without that kind of sensibility now that they're that just modern but the modern ways of consuming and living lives is a cultural thing my point is everyone doesn't need to just consume in the same way and everyone doesn't, doesn't need to relate with the world the same way and how wonderful would it be if around the world we gave people the confidence to pursue what they've always known instead of berate, give this kind of passive aggressive standard for them to look at and say like, hey, you got to be like this. So my point about bringing in uh, Vidal de la Blache again was that he believed that like everyone was doomed to become the one, one culture because there's like one right culture. You know, we're no longer an imperialistic, some would say pure imperialism doesn't exist anymore, but like culturally, Milan, Paris, these centers of like kind of fashion, for example, are still a reflection of that, that, that there's this kind of high form that is like, as if it's like a platonic, uh, Plato's high form. It's, it's not, it's just one culture. It doesn't have to be something everyone aspires for. Yeah, that is beautiful. Well, thank you. It's a, it's a really beautiful way of envisioning the world, you know, because I mean, if you can truly express your own culture while still being open to, you know, other cultures, imbibing in others, yeah. then yeah, that's, and, and where's the, what's the role of the individual, right? People might ask uh -huh. like, you know, because we, they would, the people like to argue Westerners are individualistic. Everyone else is not, but false. Uh, the sense of the individual exists in any culture, but the individual that's why, you know, in my map uh, I say, or in my website, I say the backdrop is the story. No, I'm trying to get people to focus on the idea of the backdrop, basically. We individuals need a backdrop to enact our individuality. To be the fullest individual, we need a backdrop still. And it can be, the backdrop can be negative. It could be structural violence. It could be structural barriers. Like everywhere you go, you're hitting walls. For example, indigenous peoples in, you know, where we're from, BC and Canada, everywhere they go, they meet structural barriers. You know, Black Lives Matters is, is a, re a reflection of that kind of frustration. That's a backdrop. But there's also just the idea of that, culturally speaking, uh, a person's like kind of food ways, the, the corn, the grits, the cornbread, the, um, you know, even like things that people laugh at, gators, like you know, gator tails, uh, snails, escargots, frog legs, um, uh, with the wichity grub in Australia, um, sandworms in Vietnam, all of these things. Um, th think of the last time you missed home and a certain food, the nostalgia. All of these things are meaningful. They bring meaning and they help you, they help inform your sense of self. It's mm -hmm. not to say that like culture dominates you. Like a lot of people say, like they always like to bring up female uh, circumcision or like the most extreme cultural domination stuff. But most of the time, uh, culture is first of all negotiable, so culture can change, and people can go like, "Hey, we don't really like this practice. Is there a way to pragmatically transform from it? You know, maybe instead of that kind of invasive procedure, we can do something else." Um, tattooing went from a in-group kind of identity to be hyper individualistic. Think about tattooing from its birthplace in Austronesia, in Polynesia, those cultures and how it's signaled in-groupness or a certain stage in your life and how sailor culture and then like, you know, mer uh, soldiers and then people in general, hipsters, now see it as like an individualistic sense. Culture is always evolving and it can be borrowed, it can be exchanged, it can be given back and it can change uh, for the worse or for the better. But the point is though, Culture is part of the equation of enacting our individuality. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so yeah, that's all Wade Davis, really. So mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, so we you just talked about culture and how you know, as an individual, uh, it can help you express that more. But why, or some might ask, uh, would modernization uh, be impeded by 
you yeah. know, sticking to uh, to the old ways, to the old ways, to the yeah. old cultures. You know. So what about wealth and you know um, accumulation of material goods? Right. I guess the reason why it's so weird to ask this for you uh, is because our parents had to deal with that, not us. At least where we're from, we're, we live in a post-industrial and like service industry based uh, economy and we're, we're well to do. We're more well to do than most people. There are other places around the world where this is a no brainer question because, um, you know, they're fighting against like they, they still need to find electricity or like clean san like sanitary, sanitary conditions, clean water. Right. So people might go, sh shouldn't it be the goal of humanity to just get people to a certain material condition so that they have, they are no longer wanting you know that so they reach just certain amounts of wealth my my response is it's just not a this or that question it's not a zero sum game it's the same reason why uh Neil deGrasse Tyson would go like why can't I aim for the moon and be interested in social justice right and actually having the former actually ins is inspirational and might actually feed back into things you know well it's the same in this regard but for culture instead of science or like culture instead of economics which is that in our grandparents and our parents' generation, we lost so much. So my grandparents uh, come from East Asia, so they come from Taiwan. Whereas yours, you know, had maybe more of organic evolution because you know they're from France and Quebec or whatever. So they're part of the whole Western experience, right? Organic, I don't know. Well, it was it was slower. For example, <laughs> history folded slower for them. For my grandma, it was shanty town to apartment building one generation. Do you know uh, what I mean? That's yeah. what I mean. Okay, yeah. Okay, so uh, the project of the state bureaucrat was to erase everything about uh, the old culture, the old ways, because it was an it was antithetical to getting rich, and it wasn't just about getting rich in a sense of like let's be b b bougie, you know, let's like flaunt wealth. It was getting rich in the sense of let's have tap water and let's have like running electro electricity past. Even in, like, you know, into the late evenings, not just certain times of day, those kind of things. Th that's important for sure. But culture was not antithetical. Culture has never been antithetical to technological progress. It's false. Technology or uh, knowledge is different from wisdom. They're not the same thing and they don't clash. You know, a lot of the issues that we deal with today, you know, could be armchair waved uh, and responded in an easy way saying, Oh, it's because we lost our sense of self, our culture and stuff, right? Like, you know, they might go like uh, the baby boomer generation is responsible for all of this because they were only interested, you know, in, in like gilded ideas of material progress. Um, in a way, it's true. But I mean, also, it's way too cliche and simplistic to say that. But in a way, the East Asian tiger experience and what's going on in West Africa, let's say Ghana and the Ivory Coast... What's happening in Lagos, what's happening in India, it's emulating what the baby boomers experienced. And my point is that it's, it's a tragedy that that's happening. Mm -hmm. and, and actually, Orhan Pamuk had a great line on this. Orhan Pamuk is a Turkish writer. Um, I'm reading this book called Snow right now, I'm midway through. But already there's this, like, this uh, Kurdish guy who's saying, because like, the main the theme in Snow is uh, fundamental... Islam, or not fundamental, let's say political Islam, uh, in reaction to Kemalist Turkey, Kemal, you know, Ataturk, he had like this kind of Republican, how do you say it, laissez-faire, or the uh, French word? Laïcité. Laïcité. You know, he embraced the laïcité, republicanism, or whatever. So like, yeah, no religion, religion. Yeah, yeah, secularism. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so, interestingly, the Kurds are actually the conservative ones, in this case, in, in this part of the book. He's in a Kurdish dominant uh, area, this uh, this main character. And he meets this person who's saying, now we're all prouder, but poorer. Which is to say that like now we found culture, but uh, we're no longer interested in, in modernity. Mm. And modernity is a good thing. Okay, mm. so he's like wanting the good old days of Kemalism, of, of Ataturk's vision of Turkey. Mm -hmm. And he's saying that like this whole kind of political Islam, this like kind of cultural war in Turkey that's happening even now today. Actually funny, funny when I was uh, studying in about the EU and Turkey, Erdogan was the greatest hope for Turkey joining the EU. And look at where we're at now. But anyways, the point is um, this character is, is sighing saying, 
ah, like this, uh, this like hyper uh, focus on culture is bad. You know, like why, why are we doing this and losing sight about modernity? And I'm saying it doesn't have to be this or that, you know, it's important to, to keep focus on both of those things. Mm-hmm. Right, so this relates to the title of your map, A Wealth of Nations. Yeah, the, the political map. Wealth of Nations is, you know, Adam Smith's, you know, uh, like every first year student, not just in econ, but political science or whatever, they'll, they'll all read it or at least be told to recognize the title. This is not even a jab at any of his ideas. It was a fun kind of a, a, a illusion because, uh, a, first of all, I'm not doing Wealth of Nations, I'm doing A Wealth of Nations, so it's not exactly the same. But second of all, um, I'm uh, undermining or flipping the idea of wealth. The wealth of the nation is not the material. Like, you know, it's important to say this, actually. When he was writing this and when economy, economics was, was kind of blooming, it was to try to get people to understand something that everyone missed, which is that like economics is not just about like women keeping tab of how much sugar and how much um uh, flour is in the in the larder still, you know, not like economizing the household goods that like every country, every good bureaucrat needs to be concerned about this. Right. Economics was actually revolutionary. Right. It actually did bring people out of poverty. Mm-hmm. Uh, right. Well, because in French, mm-hmm. the word economy mm-hmm. also means savings. Yeah, well, it comes it ultimately it comes from the Greek word, which yeah, is because, like so when what you're the talking women about did, the yeah. women pantry, like keeping yeah. track of their pantry. There you go. But anyway, so uh, here I'm saying wealth. Why don't we reevaluate what wealth is? Because for the last two hundred years, we had this kind of revolutionary new idea of saying like we need to be concerned about just material riches. Uh, Marxist and capitalist alike were concerned with this, right? Like it was like two sides of the same coin. Like in the 1950s, it was like uh, being asked. Do you want this kind of wealth or do you want this kind of wealth? That's it. Like, you know, do you want to be a Marxist country or do you want to be a capitalist country? But both of them were kind of like uh, missing a third point that a lot of countries in uh, the rest of the world, you know, a lot of the populations were still. And I mean, that's why the Arab Spring caught up. Right. And that's why a lot of people are like, why is this happening in the Middle East? Right. Or why is this happening in certain parts of the world? Why is there this reaction so the point is we need to reevaluate the word wealth is either it's not what we think it is, or it just needs to be added mm-hmm. with something else. Like we need to understand another layer that like mm-hmm. human society is not just this one thing. It shouldn't be just concerned about production or consumption. It should be richer in all the kind of metaphorical senses as well. Mm-hmm. Anyway, so that that's the title. Right. So this is kind of the opposite of clash of civilizations. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's the office of Huntington. Actually, um, I'm not sure if they're going to still teach Huntington uh, in political science for the new generations. I, I, I hope not. But you know what? Actually, I think, don't you think that modern professors might actually think it's more relevant now? Because all this culture war? Yeah. I think that's so sad. I mean, it might take more prominence in, you know, in courses. It, it, it's sad for us because like both of us know that he's hyper simplifying the world right and it's not very useful when you do it that way Mm -hmm. uh the way he kind of terms civilization first of all is very silly Mm -hmm. and then also uh how he draws the boundaries of civilizations is super super simplified and it's like japan is one thing and i guess his argument is yeah the conflict is going to happen on the fault lines yeah of the civilizations right but like what we know is that most of the time even historically uh but also right now in modern time the fault lines are between uh, neighbors, contact groups, constant contact groups, usually. Even uh, when Europeans went to the farthest reaches to try to like wedge themselves in, divide and conquer mm-hmm. was not just a strategy, it was actually a very logical thing to have, you know, right? So, so we know, you know, like the classic uh, argument against Huntington is the Shiites and the Sunni conflict is something that was overlooked by Huntington. Um, but really, just basically, uh, you know in my world the way i kind of like fleshed it out like you know gave story to all of it was to say like i want a lot of like cultural blocks but i want to also show how in each cultural block there's an irony which is to say there is a twist all right that's a wrap right. eh? that's a wrap eh? i can't ask this question okay let me say again <laughs> 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 i don't know how to ask you, this you nailed it eh? that was good that was good well, yeah like um okay 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that one question was uh, was a little tricky.